it's gone through a massive decline since um, about 2004 um, when the MPRDA Act was actually introduced um, because of, of the onerous conditions that have been taken or exported from the big mining sector to the small sector. And, and it's a classic example of, you know, one, one size doesn't fit all. Diamonds are forever, or are they? Well, joining me to discuss the current state of the diamond industry and its uncertain future is John Bristow. He is an independent consultant and somebody with many decades of experience in the mining sector. John Bristow, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us all the way from Hermanus. Thanks very much, David. And I appreciate the invitation. Um, as I was saying to you, I see I've been preceded by some fairly stellar characters in, in the minerals and mining business, Paul Miller and um, Hume Skulls. So hopefully I can live up to that standard. Um, and I look forward to discussing, you know, this amazing industry, which um, goes back about 2000 years. I'd encourage our viewers and listeners to check out those episodes, but those were more focused broadly on the mining industry, but I've brought you in to talk about diamonds specifically, yeah. uh, which is yeah. something that you know, perhaps doesn't feature as prominently in the mining conversations. There tends to be a lot of focus on gold and the platinum group metals as well. Uh, but could you take us back in time to the history of the diamond mining industry and how it all started back in the 1860s in South Africa, but before that in other parts of the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, historically, the diamond business goes back to, to effectively India. Um, and the, the um, Silk Road, um, whereby India fascinate, or fascinatingly has um, also over many years, and, and mostly, as I say, it started 2000 years ago, produced um, exceptional big diamonds. And, and, and for those people who followed the industry a bit, you'll have heard of the, for example, the famous coin or diamond and the Hope Diamond, and, and there are a number of others, um, you know, with well-known names. Um, many of them are in places like the Smithsonian um, Institute or Museum. And, and, and those big diamonds came out of a, a big river system, which is actually not unlike our, our Orange River system in this country, which also produces exceptionally big diamonds. And we'll, along the way, I'm sure today, talk a little bit about those exceptional diamonds. So, so those big diamonds were, were mined and traded mostly by the, Mo, the Mughals, Mughals, who um, obviously, you know, then tra traded down the Silk Road through to what is modern day, you know, Iran or Tehran and, and those, those countries. Um, so, that, so these were luxury products already back in those days being traded along with other, you know, jewels, precious stones. Um, and, and, and mined by slaves effectively in, in this massive Krishna River. Um, and I've, be, I've been fortunate enough to do work in India and go back to those um, parts of, of the big Krishna River. And you can still see some of the, the remnants of the historical workings. Yeah, I went to India in 2007 and the Red Fort in Old Delhi, a fairly unassuming uh, structure today, but... I was told that it used to be that the walls were bedecked in, in diamonds and jewels, uh, but those are yeah. all ripped out when, when old Delhi was sacked. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, so quite, a, uh, quite an auspicious history there. No, it's a wonderful history, and, and the place to go to next time is, um, is, is down in, in, um, in sort of central India, what, what is now, I guess, um, under Pradesh, um, you know, where there's the Golconda Fort, outside Hyderabad. And, and it was one of the, the, well, it became, it's quite close obviously to the, the Krishna River, which is um, probably a hundred, couple of hundred kilometers further south. And that was the point where, or, or the place where a lot of those early diamonds were actually traded and then, you know, got on the camel trains or, or, or they didn't have passenger trains in those days, but then were transported around or down the Silk Road and ended up in other parts of the world. So, so there's a whole famous history of the, of the diamond trade, which, as I say, go, goes back 2,000 years. 
and and it's it, you know it's a remarkable journey which then sort of tailed off um, the alluvial diamonds that have been produced in India um, got scarcer and scarcer the grades and in, in the in the old rivers um, became less and less and and the trade then for a while moved to to Brazil Brazil also has a a long history of alluvial diamond mining mostly and again um, biggish stones but particularly colored stones so prior to South Africa and you mentioned South Africa becoming the, the home of diamonds following the discovery on the Orange River in 1866 Brazil um, went through um, some years of also of, of, of fairly significant diamond production from sort of the, 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 the late 1500s into the early 1600s, and then that tailed off. And that was when, you know, a young boy um, supposedly on the banks of the Orange River picked up a, a pretty stone down or between Hopetown and Douglas. Um, most of us will know where Hopetown is, it's more or less where you go across the Orange River on the way to to if you're driving from Cape Town to Johannesburg. Um, and there's a farm there known as the Kulk and there's a, a, a plinth, um, you know, still demarcating that site, that um, locality where that early diamond was discovered. It was subsequently shown to a passing, um, I think he was a bit of an entrepreneur trader. Guy Atherston, I think his name was Atherston. Um, he was based out of Grahamstown and he identified it as a diamond that then ended up in London. And, and in a sense, you know, the rest is history. Um, so that so that 1866, 67 discoveries on, on their own river really were the start of what was to become, you know, South Africa's diamond industry. It was of course also that discovery and and the you know machinations of Cecil John Rhodes subsequently in the in the later 1860s and 1870s which um, you know for good or bad created the initial wealth in this country and set off um, the diamond mining frenzy and 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 the capital that you know was created and generated out of Kimberley um, then further led to you know, exploration for gold in, in the high felt, um, bearing in mind that um, gold had already been discovered in Pilgrim's Rest um, um, before the gold and the Vits. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the sort of movement of um, prospectors around the country ended up with the Vits discovery. Although, although there's, you know, again, there's an interesting side to the discovery of most of the minerals in this country. Um, David is, you know, like um, like the, the diamond discovery, it wasn't done by a geologist. It was a, a child on the banks of the river. <clears throat> the, the early gold discovery at, in the Vitz was um, at Long Lachter by effectively a farmer. And, you know, a number of our other um, discoveries have also been made um, by prospectors and farmers. The so geologists came a little late to the scene in this case. And you yourself trained as a geologist and subsequently worked in the diamond industry for, for many decades. Could you uh, give us a, a brief synopsis of how you got interested in this line of work? Yeah, absolutely. I, I grew up in a, um, a family of five boys in, in Escort in KZN, went to Escort High School. And back in those days, you know, there was, was no TV, smartphones, and all of those distractions. So, so we were a really out, outdoor family. No, no podcasts. Had, um, yeah, no podcasts as well. Um, we, we had um, two lovely headmasters at my junior school and then subsequently at Escort High School. In fact, you know, us older people will remember R.O. Pierce. He wrote a wonderful book called The Barrier of Spears, and he lived for climbing the Drakensberg. So... So we ended up spending a lot of time outdoors, um, walking or paddling canoes and so on. And, and I ended up picking up, you know, pretty rocks in, in the felt and that sort of um, created my eventual passion for geology. Studied at um, University of Natal, where I did my four year honors degree and then an MSc in geology. And then I did a, so I was a long time professional student. I also played quite a lot of fun cricket among some of the best at the time. And um, then did a PhD from 1977 to, 
1981 here at UCT. Um, and we, uh, back in those those years, um, the um, you know South, South Africa was effectively the universe for for diamonds and diamond studies and diamond research. Um, there's an interesting byline there as well. Um, when the early um, diamond mines were discovered in Kimberley, and, and many people don't appreciate, but there were actually five big holes that ended up being discovered, uh, or, or big Kimberlite pipes being discovered and then mined. Um, and, you know, those holes are still there today. Um, one of them, the Kimberley mine, not, um, Kimberley, um, De Beers mine, sorry, has been filled um, with slimes from a mining process, remining the old tailings. Anyway, when you mine those diamonds in the 18th, or those Kimberlite pipes to recover the diamonds in the 1860s, 1870s, early, and even into the early 19, sorry, the, uh, the, the um, where am I? Um, it, into the early 1900s, apologies. Um, there were no big crushers, modern crushing machines or ball mills or, or, you know, um, equipment like that to crush rock. So the early Kimberlite was laid out on what they called floors. And, and when you fly into Kimberley these days, you can still with luck um, see the outlines of those floors. So the Kimberlite was spread over these big floors, probably half a K by, by half a K in diameter or, or in dimension and left there for a year or two to effectively, you know, under the elements, rain and, and sun. Kimberlite disaggregates quite quickly. It's a relatively soft rock. And um, they then, in the early, early years, ran big um, herds of oxen across the Kimberlite or eventually the big steam tramp um, steam engines with those big steel wheels. And that broke down the Kimberlite and they would then push the soft Kimberlite aside to a dump and they'd leave the, the hard, there was a lot of sort of hard rounded boulders in the Kimberlite. Those, the, many of those big boulders turned out to be what we call nodules, um, pieces of, of the mantle um, carried from 150 more, 150 com kilometers and more <laughs> from depth. And, 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 ulti and ultimately those, those nodules or zenoliths as we call them, have provided a wonderful window into the mantle structure. So to form a diamond, um, you need about 1200 degrees centigrade and uh, 50 kilobars of, of pressure. Go and fill up your, or, or blow up your car tires, it's two bars. You're talking about 50 kilobars. Mm -hmm. and, and to get that temperature and pressure down below, below the, us in the mantle, you effectively got to go 150 kilometers deep into the earth. So, so the Kimberlites, which are the passenger trains that brought diamonds to the earth's surface, were traveling from 150, 200 kilometers down to the earth's surface. Um, and they picked up these exotic um, pieces of rock along the way, dumped them at the surface. And, and that's provided a wonderful um, sample for many geoscientists to study the structure of the earth. So, so there are many asides to this diamond business, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Oh. There's, you know, there's the wealth creation side and there's the, the, the sort of geoscientific side and being able to study the mantle as a bonus. Okay, well, thanks for the crash course in geology. How about the, the state of the industry, I guess, since the 20th century and post 1994 because it seems to have at least from my perspective its best days are behind it but i think what i'd like to discuss further on in the conversation as well is the, the potential for growth but, but how did the industry fare uh, through the latter parts of the 20th century and into into the the, the 21st century where we are today yeah, yeah david it's, it, it's a, a fascinating question and just stepping back um Again, I, I sort of mentioned it, you know, this, this industry has been a great survivor. Um, it's been through a Great Depression. It's been through a couple of world wars. Um, it's been through the global financial crash. Um, and, you know, it's recently been through COVID. And, and, and it's had some, you know, really tough times. And, um, and yet it's, it's still out there. And, and you know what? Going strong. Um, so, so if we if we come to you know more recent periods, 
um, which you which you're talking about. Um, it's um, it, it it was obviously um, through the time from um, Cecil John Rhodes, who effectively also then with the Oppenheimers became the founder of of you know De Beers. Um, you know De Beers controlled the, the industry. They were effectively a monopoly, and and for many years. Um, and until quite you know quite recently, um, they they were king of the castle. Um, they had um, the benefit of um, you know exceptional production from from the Kimberley mines. Um, they in in the early 1900s they were able to acquire the Cullinan Diamond Mine, which is again a world class large kimberlite um, body in. Um, in in just north of Pretoria, and then as part of their exploration play, um, they were able to eventually encourage and and I guess um, enter into a partnership which is still in place today, and it's been an exceptionally interesting and I think overall beneficial partnership with Botswana. Um, so so. And, and, and very interestingly, and I'm jumping a bit, you know, Africa is just a wonderful piece of real estate when it comes to, to diamond deposits. And if we start in South Africa, you know, exceptional, Botswana, amazing. Botswana has the largest um, or the second largest diamond mine being mined at Arapa, Northeast Botswana, and the world's richest diamond mine at Choneng down in the, in the southern part of Botswana near Labatsi. And then you go through, you know, and well, Namibia, Angola, um, DRC, Tanzania, all the way to West Africa. So, 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 so Africa, this African continent over the years has produced more, more than half, more than 50% of the world's diamonds since, you know, the market really got going, which was effectively post, you know, the, the early, 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 um, um, what, what are we talking about? So, so, 1866, the discovery, and then into the early 1900s, and of course now 2000. So, De Beers was was created early in the 1900s and 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 ruled the roost. De Beers um, also, as you will be aware, um, ended up with um, with contracts the, the um, with the Russians. So the Russian Russian diamond deposits were discovered in 1954. Um, and and that work was again that that was really good geological exploration work based on you know the, the, the South African model where did where do we look around um, for the model that you know we could use elsewhere in the world well you came back and looked at, at the South African model where we've got all these diamondiferous kimberlites on on a, a very old cryptonic cryptonic block um, um, it's effectively an iceberg that sits under southern Africa this big solid or block of rock that's older than two and a half billion years and you sitting sort of in the middle of it there in Johannesburg. Um, so anyway, Af Africa um, was, was, was and has been the world's biggest producer of diamonds. Um, De Beers, you know, sat in the, in the, in the, at the King's table and controlled uh, most, of the, most of the African production and then ended up with contracts with the Russians to to sell their diamonds, and and that situation carried on until you know relatively recently. Um, and at the time that I joined De Beers in in first of January 1983, um, the antitrust laws were still in place in in the in the US. So you know we De Beers employees couldn't go near the place, and potentially you you know you could get locked up. Um, you, um, De Beers, you know, through very clever mechanisms and, and offshore companies, certainly, you know, were able to sell their diamonds into the States. But again, you know, there's another facet to this, and that gets back to India, India being the world's biggest manufacturer of diamonds. So most of the world's diamonds end up being bought and manufactured in India and then resold all over the world. So, you know, that gave them some 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 sort of um, wiggle room as well. Um, and, and then ultimately, you know, at, come, came the 2000s, the world has changed sub substantially. And we've seen, you know, huge changes in, 
in the diamond business. Um, the antitrust laws eventually um, really did become quite onerous. And then the EU also stepped in, you know, to further um, start looking at, at these um, monopolies and in things like diamonds. And they too were, were involved in the dismantling of the old, um, you know, De Beers model where they controlled, you know, pr probably back in, in the, um, in the 1960s and the 1980s and you know relatively um, recently into into 2000 the um, the world's diamond supply to beers at their peak would have controlled probably 80 percent of the, of the world's gemstone market they weren't too concerned about the cheap goods um, there, there were lots of very cheap um, low quality diamonds produced, for example, at the DR, in, in the DRC or then the Congo. Um, we weren't too concerned about that. But wherever there was a, you know, a decent quality diamond to be, to be either mined or bought um, or contracted, you know, De Beers made a point of, of getting a foot in the door. Um, you know, that, and that would have included places like Sierra Leone, which produced some lovely um, gemstone diamonds, mostly out of alluvial deposits. So, so you know, came came you know the two thousands. Um, the monopoly has been disassembled, and and it's a very different um, market today. Um, and and so we see today the De Beers um, probably control, if you can call it that. It's not really control anymore. You know, maybe thirty five percent of the world's gemstone market, and that really comes back comes back to production in South Africa. But but their real, you know, key producer would be would be Botswana. So so just to give you some figures, last year Botswana produced about twenty two million carats. That that was in 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 COVID, where De Beers had actually sort of held back on production, given there were some some market issues in early. 2020 at the start of COVID. So we, we produced about 9 million carats here in South Africa. Most of that comes from um, what is now the Cullinan mine owned by Petra and um, but out of Kimberley, some out of Finch and Northern Cape and De Beers' flagship mine in South Africa, which is the Phoenicia mine up on the Limpopo River in uh, west of Messina. Um, Last year, as I said, um, Botswana was 22 million carats. Russia was 39 million carats. But to put that in perspective, very interestingly, if you look at the value of Botswana diamonds, um, their aggregate value for last year was um, $4.6 billion. Um, that's the value of the goods that came out of the ground, rough diamonds. Russian production was much larger, but the average value of, of so, stones, diamonds, was only about two and a half billion dollars. So, so we have this, you know, very interesting aspect of diamonds. No, no two diamonds are the same. Um, some Kimberlites have, um, have have high value diamonds. You know, many other, many Kimberlites around the world have diamond values which are much lower. And so, you know, one of the problems that's always been um, out there for geologists and diamantiers and, and the general public is understanding the diamond business. Um, and, 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 and one of the legacies that has probably hurt South Africa and, and I think De Beers has been the opaqueness of the industry sort of in its heyday. It was a very, um, unfortunately, opaque industry, De Beers purchased and most of the, produced most of the world's diamonds. They were all sent to London, to the DTC, the Diamond Trading Company. They were aggregated there and they were resold. And, and you know, it's, it's also an industry which has a, a stigma of transfer pricing uh, because there's no, you know, you, you will know better as well as I do that if you want the gold price, you'll go and look it up on, at the London, you know, metals market or if you want the tin price or iron ore price or manganese or you, or you name it you can go and get it instantly but there is no um, you know readily available 
price for a diamond. And, and I, I can show you a diamond, which is, you know, quite large, 10 carats, and it's black and cruddy, and it's probably worth $10. I can show you the same size diamond, which is glossy and clean, and can be worth, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars. And that's, that's always been the, the problem with, of the business. And, um, and just to digress again, it, it's been very interesting that, you know, C Canada, um, Canada, there'd always been showings of diamonds and people, you know, suspected they were also Kimberlites, but it's a, you know, it's a tough place to work. It's a um, large part of the earth's cold and covered in snow. It's not that easy or it's expensive to prospect there. Anyway, in 1991, you know, world-class diamond dis discoveries were made in Canada um, by a junior company and, you know, Canada has lots of them, junior exploration company. And suddenly there was this, you know, diamond frenzy or frenzy of exploration around, around the world. And, and because you had all these junior companies active in the market, to, um, you know, the company that went out and made the first discovery was a company led by an amazing character, Chuck Fipke, um, a grassroots prospector, and his colleague um, was actually a geoscientist and a very good glaciologist, and he helped Chuck sort of make this discovery. In, anyway, you know, those guys all raise public funds and need funding regularly to um, fund their operations. And of course, the best thing that they could um, do to achieve that was every time they found a diamond, they put it into the market with its value, with its size, with its price, the whole 2T. And, you know, if you found a, a couple of good diamonds and even what we call micro diamonds, exceptionally, you know, tiny diamonds, which we find in prospecting samples, they would put it out in, in the market. And, you know, suddenly the world started to learn about what the value of diamonds were. Um, so the Canadians did us a big favor. And, you know, that these are all events that I'm now throwing in that have really changed the diamond industry and made it a whole lot more transparent, which has been good for the industry, given, given that previous opaqueness. Um, so, so um, you know, that's, that's in the background. In, in the background, once, you know, initially a monopoly, that worked. It was um, a very smart, you know, smartly run outfit um, by very smart people. And then, the, the, you know, those people, the, the hierarchy of De Beers and obviously, you know, Anglo-American is very much still part of that process, have managed the process to, you know, through the, through the 2000s, early 2000s, to the point that, you know, De Beers are no longer in the in the controlling seat, um, they have a big competitor you know, in, in, in Russia. Um, they've had, a, an, again, a very strong competitor in, in Canada. And then um, in, in Australia too, Australia again has, you know, big expanses of geology. A lot of the geology there is similar to what you find in, in Southern Africa and, and it has cratons and old areas and young areas, and it has had kimberlites and diamond deposits. Anyway, in, in 1983, in the early 1980s, there was a world-class diamond mine discovered in Northwest Australia called the Argyle Diamond Mine, which, um, you know, suddenly shock horror was not in the, in the grip of De Beers and produced um, at its peak, about 40 million carats. But the, you know, the average, average of those diamonds, the average production value was $9 a carat, so real cheap goods. But again, um, credit to De Beers and, and the Indian Diamantes um, and Argyle Diamonds, they collectively were able to ensure that that you know, real um, large avalanche of cheap diamonds were, were absorbed by the market and were cut and polished um, by Indian diamantiers, mostly, um, mostly family businesses, mostly based in Surat in Northwest India. And, and, and that, that, again, is just a very good example of how this business has managed to keep adapting to change and, and to challenges. And, and as it you know, has done for example, I mentioned through the global financial crash and, and again through COVID. 
So, so you know, it's not a business to be under, underestimated by any means. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strong world business and it's still going well. So, John, let's turn the conversation now to South Africa's diamond industry. And I remember growing up listening to Paul Simon's Graceland and he sang about having diamonds on the soles of your shoes. So I guess uh, that is true, given what you said about South Africa's rich uh, diamond endowment. Um, so yeah. l let's talk about the policy framework uh, as well as the, the industry. So, I mean, we have the Mineral Petroleum Resources uh, Development Act, the NPRDA, that is quite constraining of, in, in, particularly in terms of the uh, mineral rights that miners have, there's a number of regulations around empowerment, et cetera, all of which are constraining the industry. Could you, could you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, David. I mean, the Minerals Petroleum Development Act, um, Minerals and Energy Petroleum Development Act has, um, um, you know, been a big game changer. And and I think, um, and, and, and I, I was um, to an extent part of that. Um, we put together, I, I left De Beers in, in 1994 and helped put together an, an NGO known as the Minerals and Energy Policy Center where we you know, took on board young, young technocrats, mostly young black um, graduates and, and people who had either done some geology or hadn't. And and helped expose them to to the minerals industry, and also took them overseas to look at how um, countries like Australia and Canada and others ran their mineral jurisdictions, and and so it it was and and we helped write the original white paper. A lot of it, a lot of the really good work was done by Richard Good, who I think is still at the South African or the Development Bank. And um, so, so it, it, you know, it was a good piece of work. And I think everyone at the time was, um, you know, very enthusiastic about the changes going on in South Africa under, under uh, Mr. Mandela. And, um, and there was clearly a need for change. Of course, at that time, you know, one of the big arguments is that the existing large mining companies had sat on mineral rights and, and deposits for for many years and hadn't always developed them uh, because they had, you know, pipelines that were, were were very active and they would typically develop, you know, the easy parts or the rich parts, but they hadn't necessarily gone and looked at some of the other deposits they should have. Anyway, so that that legislation came along with change. Um, and um, and we saw, you know, many, many people also at the time. Um, were able to access mineral rights that they hadn't previously been able to and, and develop them. And there were a number of new deposits, new cement factories, for example, developed by, um, by, by companies and, and other deposits also developed. Um, and, 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 you know, un unfortunately, along the way, I don't think it's really achieved what it um, should have um, achieved. And 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 that takes me to sort of a you know a passion of mine is that um, if if you want to maintain your mineral your mineral endowment you really need to keep on exploring and you need to to f keep finding you know new art new ore bodies to find you know ore, depo ore deposits that have been depleted never forgetting that you know all these um, gold mines platinum mines. Um, got diamond mines all have a finite life. Um, obviously, the, the lifespan of a mine also is dependent on the economics. Um, if prices go up, you know you can mine low grade ore. If prices go down, you you can't. Um, but but along the way, um, I think um, we we've ended up with a, an imperfect system, um, and it's really stifled the, the South African mining industry. And it's created, um, you know, probably too many layers of, um, of, of regulation and red tape, and and it hasn't it hasn't fostered um, exploration. And 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 one of the big reasons, and you've had a couple of previous experts like Hume Skulls and and Paul Miller talk about this, I'm sure. But you know, we 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 don't have a, a particularly um, 
reliable and efficient uh, mineral cadastre system whereby you you know you know what mineral rights or, or properties are out there and available available for prospecting you know which ones are being actively mined and and importantly you know which ones have been you know shut down and you know should be rehabilitated so we don't you know we we unfortunately have this big problem of old mine dumps and mines that haven't been you know, closed properly or rehabilitated and create dust and other pollution problems or have become, you know, hotbed for Zama Zama. So, so those are, are, some, are some of the negatives, you know, in the background. Um, and, 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 and what you see is when you go to countries like Australia and, and Canada, um, you know, access to information, um, access to a cadastre system is very easy. If I want to go and explore for it you know for diamonds in the northwest of australia i can i can almost make an application from sitting in my desk in amanus on my laptop that's how efficient the cadastra systems are in in those countries and and you know the best examples are australia and canada and and botswana for that matter too is is a really you know very friendly place to go and explore and to find new deposits. And so, you you know, again, we see at the moment, particularly after, you know, diamond prices have also increased after COVID. Um, we've had kickups in, you know, most of the world's prices, uh, mineral prices post COVID. And so Botswana is a busy place. And if you compare that to South Africa, it's a very different Yeah, You know, it's just too hard. We see less and less investment in year, every, every year in our mineral sector. Um, so, so as I say, I, I think the process started well. It hasn't ended up well, and it's been very negative for uh, our, our, our minerals and mining industry. If we get back to diamonds, um, yes, our, our diamond industry is an old industry. It's been going since you know the late 1800s, and and most of our our world class diamond mines, the big ones, are effectively. No, not completely, but largely mined out. Um, um, Phoenicia Diamond Mine, which is De Beers' flagship mine, as I said, in this country, is just um, transitioning from an open pit to an underground mine. So, you know, it's got another 10, 10 or 20 or 30 years life of mine ahead of it. Um, the Cullinan Mine, north of Pretoria, again, has probably another 20 or 30 years or maybe maybe even longer, but it's an underground mine. Um, where, where, we, where, where we see a real problem is um, in, in what we would call the small and junior mining sector, and particularly our, our diamond sector. Um, because we had all these Kimberlites bringing diamonds to surface in this country, um, you know, the Kimberley pipes are a very good example. Um, they, most of the Kimberley pipes are 80 million years, and those pipes, at the time of eruption or placement um, 80, 80, 90 million years ago, that's how old those pipes are. Those pipes are 85 million years. The land surface at Kimberley was probably up to a kilometer higher than it is today. And, and, and that land surface has over those 85 million years been planed down, weathered. Um, you know, it's been beaten up by big rivers like the Vaal and Orange. And it's um, it's been um, effective, effectively deflated, and those diamonds that sat in the top parts of those now eroded pipes, and the same applies in Botswana, have been transported down our big rivers to the west coast. So at the west coast, we have amazing um, marine and coastal diamond deposits on our old beaches, and we have wonderful um, alluvial deposits all the way or most of the way down the Orange and Val River, um, you know, heading between say Kimberley uh, to, to our West Coast. And, and we, we have, um, you know, great opportunities in this country to go and mine those, what we would call secondary or alluvial diamond deposits. But again, coming from a big mining industry here in South Africa, we had all these big gold mines, deep gold mines. So, when you have a deep gold mine, your health and safety regime has to be very rigid and tight. 
Um, you know, we have the same thing in the platinum mines. Our big um, diamond mines, most of them are now heading down to the ones that are still going about a, a thousand uh, meters, nearly a kilometer. So obviously, you know, your your health and safety and pumping and haulage and all of that stuff has to be done to world class standards. Um, when you get onto the alluvial deposits, which are really just um, um, shallow open cast operations, we don't mine in the rivers, but you know, up on the banks or up on the, the old um, terraces, um, you, you then have the opportunity to recover exceptional diamonds. Again, as those diamonds are carried from the Kimberlites down these big rivers, they get attritioned uh, over, again, 85 million years. It's like a big mill, a big river taking diamonds, you know, down rapids and waterfalls is going to end up crushing the very poor quality diamonds and leaving you with the big or, or the high quality and exceptional gemstones. So, so where's a diamond population in a, in a pipe around Kimberley might have been or average $150 a carat run of mine, as we call it. By the time it gets down the Orange River, it can be up to two or $3,000 a carat run of mine. When we get to the West Coast, you know, the West Coast was where the diamonds were, were ultimately carried to and reworked, mostly smaller diamonds. Those diamonds typically average five, $600 a carat, but exceptionally, exceptional white, beautiful stones. So, so we, it, it, it's that it's that small and junior, or what we also call mid-tier sector, that we really have um, not helped to grow. In fact, we've we've impeded to, impeded it to the point that it's gone through a massive decline since um, about 2004, um, when the MPRDA Act was actually introduced. Um, because of, of the onerous conditions that have been taken or exported from the big mining sector to the small sector. And, and it's a classic example of, you know, one, one size doesn't fit all. We, we really need, um, you know, different enabling um, legislation, less red tape. Um, um, you still have to have obviously mine health and safety requirements. You need rehabilitation requirements, but it should be at, at the appropriate level for, for the job that's been done on the ground. Yeah, that is, I think, where we've really, you know, done a poor job of nurturing and um, or, or instead of nurturing the small sector. And it's, you know, it's probably no different to the entrepreneurs. We have amazing entrepreneurs in this country. But I don't think, you know, across all business sectors, I don't think we really help them. We still locked into, you know, the old mindset of big business is better. Um, so that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to say is that we, we at, as these big old ore bodies of ours get older, deeper, more expensive to mine, eventually they are going to run out. But we have a jewel box of mid-tier and smaller deposits, um, you know, be it diamonds, be it um, lithium and pegmatites up in the Maquilan, be it um, the Maquilan nickel deposits, um, you know, we have many other minerals aside from just diamonds, gold and platinum. And we really should be making a bigger effort to get out there and look for those other mineral deposits and, and rebuilding a small diamond mining sector. Yeah, I took a trip to Namibia in April and went canoeing along the Orange River. Unfortunately, I didn't see any alluvial diamonds on the riverbank. I was looking though, um, yeah. but it's just incredible to uh, on that road trip just to see uh, the kind of richness uh, of you know, various uh, mines and, and so on, iron ore, etc. Yeah. Um, and and just to reflect on on, on that uh, rich resource endowment. But now, how do we crowd in some of these junior miners, John? And you spoke about impediments. Uh, what are those impediments exactly? And how do we start to break some of those down? Because this is the Solutions Podcast. We want to hear what proposals you have. Okay. Well, I, well, I mean, you know, those impediments are, um, to start with, I think we could, um, you know, make heaps of improvement and, and, and leap forward, David, with... Um, a decent modern cadastral system. 
and as I say, and 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 um, you know, I I can very quickly find out what's available, what areas can be explored in Botswana or Namibia or or Canada or, or Australia. And why don't and, we have that here in South Africa? Well, we 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 seem to be anti-transparency. I think you know is one of the big problems. I think. Um, Sadly, and you know, it comes up every day in the newspapers. We've had this horrible, you know, years of corruption, and um, that's had a huge impact on, on, on the country. We, 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 uh, our, our, our Samrad um, cadastre system, from the day of its inception, you know, back in I think it was about 2008, um, has been, been, been a nightmare. Um, you know, to the point that it's um, really hampered investment, and 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 I've been actively involved in in the small diamond sector. And as I said to you, I've spent most of my life in this sector, and I made the tr transition from you know working for the beers, which was a wonderful experience, into the small sector. I raised money, or we raised money, a group of us in Canada, and and we ran a couple of public companies, you know, mining diamonds along the Orange River. But when it takes you, you know, two, three, and even four years to to make an application for a prospecting right or a, a mining right, um, and and once you've got that, then you still have to get a water, you know, water use permit or a water use license, um, a WUL as they call it, W U L, um, and then you've got um, a social and labor plan um, that that hooks onto that application. And then you've got to make sure you have your BE partner lined up. Um, all, all of those for, for, for small operators and, and mid-tier operators become you know real impediments. And then when you when you have further you know overlaid layers of um, mine health and safety requirements. Um, rehabilitation. I'm not for one minute saying, you know, none of the, all of those things should be done, but done to an appropriate level and standard where, where the small guys and many of these operations, particularly alluvial diamonds, um, you know, alluvial diamond deposits are not bankable. You, you, you've been around the block, you'll know what, what bankable means in terms of an ore body. So if I find an ore body, or it's the same thing as you know, if you put together, if you're looking to build a business, you put together a business plan, you take it to your banker. He says, yes, that looks good. He does some background checks on you and, and you've effectively got a bankable business plan. You know, they'll loan you money. You've got to obviously make a return. When it come, becomes to many of these smaller mineral deposits, be it diamonds or, um, you know, lithium would be a good example or tungsten or tin, they 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 very that they, they sort of small um, mid-sized mineral deposits. They tend to be irregularly dispersed, you know, through the rocks or through through the gravel, for example, in alluvial uh, diamond deposits. You can drill holes, you can um, take bulk samples, and you can model them. But there's always um, a, 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 an element of uncertainty, and and hence they become. Very difficult to bank. So, so many of these small alluvial diamond deposits are actually, you know, they started off as mom and pop of pop businesses, but they've got, you know, mostly bigger than that. That they they effectively run by entrepreneurs, and there will probably be, you know, a partnership of three businessmen or or miners who get together and they throw their hat in the ring and they throw their money and you know into into the ring as well and they go out and do set up their own businesses and they might have months you know where they don't find you know a couple of big stones that pay pay the diesel and the labor and you know make a profit so so they're more risky type operations and and again um you know you'll probably also be familiar with our banking system and our you know way that our parents put their money in mutual funds and looked after them we've never had the sort of um, somewhat gambling approach um, that you know you get in Canada and, and Australia to support entrepreneurs you know there's more um, readily available risk capital and and we haven't had that in this market and you know when I look at um, you know the number of small companies uh, that we have listed today it's minuscule 
And, and I think, you know, we're seeing a massive decline in the number of companies list, listed on our stock exchange. So, so when, when you're an entrepreneur running your own business, you know, you need to manage your costs very, very carefully. Um, the risks are high. And you really need an enabling environment that will allow them to get on. So if you want to apply for a license, it should be quick. Um, you know, there's absolutely no reason it takes you two or three years to get a license in other parts of the world um, or Botswana. I can get it probably a mining right in, in three or four three or four months, uh, prospecting right. You can get it probably in, in a couple of weeks if the ground's available. Um, so, so a cadastro system... And, and a system which creates transparency um, is, is something we need. Um, we have a wonderful system, ironically, that's made in Cape Town um, by a little company called Spatial Dimension out of Pinelands. That cadastro system, that, that company was bought out by Trimble, the world's largest land management system. And that system has been rolled out all around Africa and all around the world. But for some reason, you know, our local um, politicians and and um, government departments, um, you know, find or see fit not to at least um, invite them to tender. So you know, they they they're not in the not in the race, so to speak. I wonder um, why. I mean, government often makes a noise about localization and beneficiation. Local and here we have a, a globally competitive company on a literally uh, on our no, shores that uh, that yeah. that's blocked. Mm, yeah. yeah, so I think that goes yeah. to some of the governance problems and just the, the outright collapse of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy and, you know, a, a succession of, of poor ministers uh, who have really, uh, you know, let down the country in terms of its uh, appropriate governance of the mining sector. Yeah, David, I'd agree fully. I'm, I'm very strong about that. You know, I'm a good straight shooting South African. You know, we have this wonderful endowment. Well, come on, you know, and if I go back to the the founding charter of the, um, you know, the ANC, it was, you know, the resources in the ground are there for the people. Well, I don't think we're going to achieve, achieve that un unless we actually, you know, start um, seriously fixing some of these challenges we have, um, you know, like it or not. And I, I fully accept there's some, you know, real serious legacies um, from the mining industry. You know, all the way from pollution to silicosis. Um, you know, the, the the hostels were never a good system. Um, you know, so we have those legacies, but but we 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 had a world class um, you know mining industry. We still have um, you know an exceptional legacy of being able to mine mineral deposits. So somehow we've got to turn that you know negative legacy into a positive. And and you know if we're going to recreate the jobs that we desperately need to get people off the street. We need to, to start um, looking forward and, and, and you know, re-energizing what we were good at. I mean, we have, we have amazing farmers in this country. We have amazing, an amazing history of mining. You know, how can, we, how can we turn that around into a positive? How can we you know, start redeveloping these small deposits? Um, you know, a lot, lot of our alluvial diamond deposits are, are in the Northern Cape. Now, the Northern Cape's a bit fortunate, um, you know, given its, its exceptional manganese and iron ore deposits in the Northern part of the Northern Cape, up around Sish and Katu, hot as hell. So, so, you know, there is already a, a sort of big footprint up there, but, but we need, you know, we need more mining. You know, if you drive through the small towns of Balmer and Stutt and, and um, Blumhoff, and Douglas and, and all of those, you know, small, small towns, they're really desperate places. And, you know, when I see the, the you know, the, the thousands of tin shacks springing up um, west of um, Clarksdorp and around Volmer and stuff, I mean, you know, this is a wealthy country. We, we shouldn't be in that position where, you know, millions of people live in a tin shack. It's three by four meters. It's crazy. Um, you know, so so mining and farming, you know, have been core businesses, and let's try and, you know, turn those around. And, and most of all, in the Northern Cape and the Northwest Northwest Province is another very good example. It produces gorgeous um, alluvial 
um, diamond deposits um, and it's over the years, you know, been quite successfully mined, but there's still a big resource out there that, um, that we need to, you know, exploit. And we have the skills, we have the technology to do it. We have the entrepreneurs to do it, but we just make it very difficult to, to you know, apply for a license, get a license, uh, meet with the department, and, and most of all, do it in a time frame that is cost effective. Um, I, I mean, I, I helped and, and did it as a, as a sort of trial exercise, helped a, a really decent um, um, black, um, black miner in, in Bakerville. Bakerville is an old famous diamond mining area north of Lichtenberg. Um, diamonds were discovered there, mostly alluvial diamonds, and I think about the 1920s, 27, and, and millions of carrots were produced in a very short time. And, and the place, you know, has been left in a bit of a mess. Um, there hasn't been great, re you know, rehabilitation over the years. And, and I helped uh, a black gentleman there, out of a nice guy who's, who's sort of a descendant of some of the, the early mine workers from that area, um, get a, a, a five hectare um, mining permit. Now in our legislation, as it stands, we have um, legislation, which is meant to be, you know, exactly that. It's meant to be a five hectare, five hectares today is not a big area of ground that, that um, you know, small miners, um, informal miners can come and apply for and use pick and shovel to mine. Anyway, you know, it took us 13 months and 130,000 Rand to get that um, five hectare mining permit awarded. And that's just bizarre because, you know, he's working with a pick and shovel. If I look at a Google Earth picture of that piece of ground, um, you know, it's been unrehabilitated. It's been mined a couple of times before. There are no um, rare frogs or, you know, special plants or graves that, you know, should be protected. And you should be able to, I, I, you know, I can do it in Botswana or somewhere else, you know, make that application in six weeks and pay an, a nominal fee, you know, for that application. And yes, then, then you know, have, have him you know, do it properly, help him, uh, make sure there is some record keeping, make sure the diamonds are sold professionally. But it, but it gets to the point, and, and I think that was, you know, discussed at some length with Hume Skulls and probably with Paul. Um, it's got to the point in this country where it's much easier to do things illegally, because if you're going to wait for, for 13 months to get a, you know, a five hectare mining permit, it, it just doesn't make sense. You know, I've, I've actually said to the individual who's a, who's a lovely guy and he's got a, a family to support, you know what, we should have used that 130,000 and, and I'm talking, you know, off the cuff here, we should have used that money to buy you, a, you know, better equipment, a water cart, a water pump, so when it rains, for example, and we've had exceptional rain over the last two years in the interior, and so his work, little workings and trenches get flooded, but he doesn't have the money to go and buy a pump to pump out the working. You know, so it's a, it's a vicious, vicious downward spiral. And you'll know as well as I have that, you know, illegal mining, the Zama Zamas are out of control in this country. And that applies to diamonds, alluvial diamonds, West Coast. It applies to gold, it applies to coal. Um, illegal sand mining is huge. But, you know, if you're going to have to wait for a, a permit for 13 months, you know, and people are desperate to put food on the table, people are going to resort to that. They, they've got to feed families. Obviously, there's a lot of illegality, illegality and the, the syndicates get involved, and it just becomes a downward spiral. But, you know, we really need, if, if, if we generally, and, and I think all of us, again, myself included, believe in transformation and ownership. Yeah, yeah, we all understand why BEE was introduced, but but I don't believe it's really achieved what it should have or what, what it was meant to achieve. Um, we, we need proper transformation. We have amazingly resourceful people in this country and let's you know give them the opportunities to to help develop and benefit from our resources i think the great mistake of be was this undue focus on ownership at the at the high level um, yeah. 
but mm. you know what about making financing available for you know some of the the small players like you described but i do think that the this focus on artisanal mining is perhaps misguided this is a point that hume skulls made um you know there's only so much that you can do with a pick and a shovel uh, what we need are those kind of mid-cap players to be uh, entering into the market and, and scaling up their activities and you know uh, people talk about some of the negative externalities of mining like the environmental effects and so on but you know we have to have a very frank conversation about trade-offs in this country you know with unemployment at 34 percent it's just an unsustainable situation and you have to ask those people you know, would you like a job in a, a well-functioning mine? I think they would jump at the opportunity. So, you know, I think we need to be a bit selective about the the issues that we that we choose to focus on. Absolutely, David. I'm I'm the first one. You know, I'd love the world to go green. I, I, I'm I'm not cynical. I, I'm I'm you know I believe in that. But if we're going to really achieve that, we need to change lifestyle. But but most importantly, we're not going to achieve any of that or just transition if we don't get people off the street. And 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 as I say, and 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 I've just been on a road trip around the country, and and I must say I was very concerned at what I saw in all respects. Um, you know, we we went back, we we had a diamond short course, online diamond short course in June, and we had a series of field trips, and and a lot of it was aimed at taking young students. Um, fourth year university students and some third years, you know, out into the field to give them exposure. So we had a wonderful online course pulling in people from all over the world. And then we we took um, three days of field trips, mine trips out of Kimberley. And we took a field, a, a mine trip to Cullinan and we took a mine trip to a small mine near Swart Riggins. It was a great experience for the students. And, um, and, and you, see, you see the potential out there. And, and and unless you know we can start um, getting people off the streets and employing them and 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 redeveloping you know resources or, or developing resources that still sit there. I mean, I haven't. I've talked about the alluvial deposits, and those would be mostly in the northwest province, very extensive, and down the the Orange River, um, typically Hopetown to Douglas, Douglas to Presco, and then at the lower end of the Orange River. And, and our West Coast, we still have lots of potential on the West Coast, um, but mostly now getting into the marine setting, but you know, that, that and probably another discussion, but there's opportunity there. But we also have um, a large number of small Kimberlites, not the big world-class elephants. Um, those have all been mined out, but we have, we have um, small Kimberlite pipes, several, you know, several of them sort of in the Kimberley area and then we have also fissures. So, so those the Kimberlite pipes typically getting to sort of a kilometer down, they start getting much smaller and typically they root or they become fissures. So, so the, the original sort of cracks um, from great depth through the earth's structure or the earth's crust would have been cracks. And then when you got close to the to the surface, probably within a couple of kilometers of the surface, that kimberlite magma would, would have sort of been able to have enough energy to drill a hole and create a pipe. Anyway, so so if, if you erode away the pipes, ultimately you get to the root, and those roots are either small kimberlites or, or fissures. So we have north of Kimberley, we have the Bells Bank fissure system. Um, we have fissures um, at um, Swart Riggins, a mine called Helen. We used to have them in the Free State. So there are other small, small Kimberlites that could or should have been, again, small, small mines. You know, again, in fairly rural areas where, you know, 150 jobs as will be created in the small mine that is being redeveloped called Helm near Swipe Riggins, you know, 150 new employees in, in the Swipe Riggins area is huge. And, and I think, you know, you will know, you can, you know, typically I think in the mining space, we use a, a multiplier of 10. It's probably more in places, it's probably less than others where, you know, the, the extra family members, unfortunately also get supported by, by that, you know, single miner. So you know, if we can if we can recreate those sort of small mining operations, we we can make a difference, in my view. 
and 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 just to stress again, it's not just about diamonds. It's also, you know, a lot of other um, sort of niche mineral deposits um, that that we have in this country of ours. This amazing jewel box that we should also be looking to liberate. Yeah, and uh, I was at a wedding a few months ago. I was speaking to two geologists, and they told me that the rock formations in Barberton are some of the oldest in the world, about four and a half billion years old, which is practically the, the age of the earth itself. So I think we tend to get quite obsessed with South Africa at a social and political level, but uh, we neglect to, to remember just how blessed we are with uh, our natural environment here. It really is unique. But no, uh, no, we, we, we're absolutely wonderfully endowed, and we've, you know, we've got a shared round better, um, David. Unfortunately, we have, and I guess it's real, we have this label as the most unequal country in the world. Well, you know, we need to all knock our heads together and start thinking about how we address that. And obviously, providing jobs goes, you know, goes to one of the first points. Well, John Brissot, I wanted to thank you very much for joining me on the Solutions Podcast. Thanks, David. Thanks for an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm.